Good evening and welcome. I'm going to be very, very brief for anybody who does not know me. I'm Sharon Hirsch. I'm the president of Rosemont College. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you here this evening for our first lecture being hosted by the Institute for Ethical Leadership and Social Responsibility. Uh, the Institute was founded in 2012 in part due to a uh, generous grant from Mr. Harry Halloran and Halloran Philanthropies, which means that we're now in our seventh year of offering programs, lectures, general awareness about ethical issues and social responsibility. So welcome. I'll turn it over to one of our co-directors of the Institute, Dr. Alan Preddy. Thank you, Sharon. I will be quite brief. Um, uh, many of you will have seen the email that President Hirsch sent out yesterday inviting you all to attend tonight. And you may have noticed that she made reference to Shandai Harrell's unique first person perspective on the issues of mass incarceration and uh, issues um, uh, in connection with uh, the criminal, what perhaps Shandai would call the criminal injustice system. And before we sent that email out, I wanted to make sure that Shandai was comfortable with this information being shared in public. And so I called him and I said, Shandai, um, look, you have a problem with this. Um, and he said, Alan, are you kidding me? And in that pause, I didn't know which way it was going to go. I had a sense, and, and my sense was, 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 was confirmed when he said, listen, I've done what I've done. I do what I do. It is what it is. I've got no qualms. If you want to share with the campus community that I am a, a formerly incarcerated person, that I spent 25 years in federal prison, please do. That's not what it's about at this point. It's about what I'm doing now. And um, I don't know if he's going to talk to you about his experiences. He may or may not. But what I do know is that he's going to talk a lot about solving problems in connection with, with, with these issues that he's going to talk about. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming John Ayerwell. Thank you so much. This is my second time at Rosemont, and I've enjoyed my previous visit. The last time I had a panel discussion with some distinguished uh, professors and other folks who work in the field. We had a very lively back and forth discussion. But tonight is just me. So I'm going to first begin by giving you a little background about myself. And when Dr. Prenti you know, called me and said, you know, um, I kind of disclose who you are. I'm like, you know, I was a bank robber. I was a gangster. I mean, I was a serious gangster. You know, not like the BT gangsters you see now. The the video gangsters who are giving gangsters a bad name because we had values, we had morals. You know, if I shot at you, it was because you did something to me, and I was never going to shoot at you if you're around your you know, children or your mother. You know, um, we didn't uh, invade people's homes. Um, we didn't shoot at the blocks. We didn't snitch on each other. If we were caught by the police, we took our time and we carried our weight and no one else came to prison through our efforts. It was a totally different vibration and a totally different era. And now when I look at videos, and I look at my neighborhood, and I look at the criminal justice system, and I often go to CJC, which is the criminal justice center in Philadelphia, but now I'm going in a different capacity as a social worker, as the executive director of the Center for Attorney Citizens, as an advocate for our clients, and it's so nice to go into a courtroom and know you're going to come out. But it's also a different vibration looking at the criminal justice system from an advocate point of view, especially after spending 25 years in federal incarceration. So let me tell you a little bit about that before I go into what I'm doing now, because what I'm doing now is a direct result of my experiences. I did my first federal bit in 1981 probably before most of you were born, the students. And I did a 
seven and a half on 15 years. And I came home for three and a half years. The first years I was home, I was seriously into doing the right thing, but many times, the farther you get from the prison gates, the more your memory fades of what you went through. And you get sucked back into a lifestyle. And the criminal lifestyle is a conducive one. I've never been a drug addict. Um, my criminal activities were of choice. I was addicted to life in a fast lane. I was addicted to the entire persona of being a gangster and having that respect and street credibility and you know, flying to Vegas and doing all the things that we did inside of that lifestyle. But while I was doing that, I never saw the damage that we were doing to our communities. Because those of us who sold drugs, those of us who murdered, shot people, did unspeakable things, we can never take back those things that we did. When you sell drugs, you spread a circle of desperation, destruction, and despair in ever-widening circles in your community. And you're doing more damage than the police, than the prosecutor, than the government, than anything that you could possibly do. We look at movements like Black Lives Matter, and we talk about what really matters in our community. <coughs> well, in our day and time, and even now, we are not respecting black lives when we do crime in our community. And that's something I had to learn over a period of time. And I didn't learn it in my first prison sentence. Because I came home, I went back to robbing banks, I went back to selling guns, I went back to being a gangster because I knew how to do it. It was easy and it was an incredible amount of money in a short period of time. But what I didn't do when I came home is continue to go to the law library and keep up with the current trends in criminal justice. So when I was incarcerated for my second bank robbery offense, I did not know that the laws had changed. And now, instead of one third of your time in federal prison, you were looking at 85% of your time. So when the judge gave me 20 years for bank robbery and gun charges in 1991, I was looking at 18 straight years of incarceration. And it really made me reevaluate who I was as a person and what my future was going to be. Because you tend to think, you're a good father, because I took care of my children. You're a good husband. My wife had everything that she could ever want. Those inside of my community and my family, I looked out for. But when a judge tells you that society needs to be protected from you for the next 20 years, you have to take a hard, cold look at who you really are. And many of us don't want to do that. But for my first year or two of my new incarceration, that's what I did. I played back all the memories in my head. I examined my life. And I came to the conclusion that it was necessary for me to transform myself into who I could be. Because we often have a sense of who we are. But that's not really who we are. That's what you present to the world. What prison does for you, if there's a benefit to prison, is it makes you face reality. And it puts you on a elemental level. We like to say that prison was like a furnace. And it burned away everything that was superfluous. Because inside of prison, you don't have your house and your car and your money and your beautiful wife and your you know, adorable kids. All that's gone. Everybody's the same. No matter how much money you have on the street, you can only spend $200 on the commissary. We're all wearing the same brown clothes and the same gray sweatsuits. And all you have inside that prison is the force of your personality, your word, and your character. And that's what carries you through. Well, that's what destroys you. Because so many people 
cannot exist in that environment. And they go crazy or they commit suicide. Or they become other than who they were. But those of us who embraced life, and you have to embrace life in that situation. You have to build and every day work to fill your life with beneficial things. And you have to look for those who are positive in that environment to move you forward. So I determined very early in my sentence that I was going to seek out the most positive elements inside the prison. Because the prison is like any other part of society. There's a structure, there's a hierarchy. It goes by what your offense was, who you were, where you live, who you run with, especially in a federal prison because it's a national prison system. So it's grouped by cities and regions and gangs and sets. And that determines how you live your life. Very early in my sentence, I was blessed to come into the social circle and eventually the mentorship of Dr. Matulis Record. Anybody ever heard that name before? No? Yes? Who is it? I've heard the name, I'm not sure. Okay. Who's the best rapper in the universe? Tupac Shakur. Yeah. Tupac Shakur, yes. <laughs> At least in my view. Mm -hmm. Somebody say Lil Wayne, I got serious beef with you. Big <laughs> Bill's be faking too. Although he's slowly coming around. Um, last month I went to a, um, a uh, program in Center City and Big Bill's was there and he talked smarter than I ever thought he could talk. He seriously impressed me. I don't think he had 12 spare brain cells to rub together. <laughs> but he talked about his life, and I guess as you move through different situations, you mature and you become smarter, and Nicki Minaj being gone is a very good thing. <laughs> so I was talking about Dr. Matilda Shakur, and he was a major influence in the life of T Tupac and his music and his philosophy. The reason I love Tupac and his music and his way of crafting the world is because his songs meant something. And you could listen to them and you could feel that revolutionary vibe or that family vibe. You know, when you listen to Dear Mom and you could, you know, Picture your mom. And even hit him up, you know. I love that, even though that was crazy. <laughs> but what Doc did is he drew all of the brightest minds in the jail into what we call a circle of consciousness. All the writers and the thinkers and the schemers and the dreamers. And we held classes in 1994 when, <coughs> in its infinite wisdom, Congress said there'd be no more college in any prison. And that was incredibly stupid. That was a Trump moment back in 1994. <laughs> because here's the reality. You have prisons across the country filled with minds waiting to be nourished. But you say you're not going to spend Pell Grants on prisons. When they're in a situation where they, where perhaps for the first time in their life, they've slowed down enough to think about life, think about the world, and learn and create a base of knowledge. One of the most important things for you as a student here, why you should be in college, is to create a foundation for your life. It's not always about the individual class you're in. It's about learning how to think, learning how to structure ideas, learning how to take in knowledge and grow in as a person. And that's what a higher education does. So when you take that away from people, it's a serious testament. So what we did is we invited Georgia State University through our education department. And they came in with their professors and their students and the community activists 
and we created our own curriculum. And even though it wasn't accredited, it was extremely powerful because we knew what we needed. And even though there were varying levels of education, those of us who were more educated were instructed to teach those who were less educated, and we created a family behind the prison walls. And that's what's necessary. Because when you're behind prison walls, you talk to your wife and your kids in 15 minute phone calls. Or you visit for four or five hour intervals every couple of months. So it's necessary to create a family inside of the wall because that's what sustains us as human beings. I'm sure here in this college, you create friendships that sustain you because your family's not here. So think of how it is when you're behind a wall and you can't see your wife and you can't see your kids and you're physically incapacitated into a small area. So for the next 14 years, through three different joints, we started out in Lewisburg, PA, then we were transferred eventually to USP Atlanta, where I spent 12 years, and then finally to USP Coleman. I worked with Dr. Matula Shakur, and I learned so much, and I was able to expand my base of knowledge and teach so many people, and now we have graduates of our program all over the country who have come home and are doing work similar to what I'm doing and other folks doing so many amazing things. So the time that I spent incarcerated and the foundation of knowledge that I built and the curriculum that we incorporated went into the, the vision of the Center for Returning Citizens. Because when I came home in 2009, what I saw was that those who were tasked with my transition and my freedom, frankly, were bullshit. And they didn't care about me as a person or my family or what I was trying to do. They were there for a paycheck and to facilitate their own life. And they were not geared to help me find employment, help me find housing, help me find my way. And I was a person who had spent the last 16 years preparing for freedom. So I looked around me in a halfway house and I saw so many guys who, and females, who had no idea of what transition was supposed to be. And I went to various organizations like the Philadelphia, the um, Philadelphia Mayor's Office of Reentry and the Pennsylvania Prison Society and the Connection Training Services. These organizations are tasked with the reentry of formerly incarcerated, but what they were doing was reentry had become a hustle. And it was a lot of social workers and administrators who were making 60, 70, 80,000 dollars a year administering our reentry and not really doing it. So once I left the halfway house and had stable housing and began to work and to go to college, my thought process was, I can do this better. Because I know what reentry is. I know what incarceration is. I've spent 18 straight years dealing with the reality of mass incarceration. I know what social injustice is. I know what white supremacy is and white privilege. First hand, I'm a Rastafarian quick which is a whole other story for a whole other lecture. I belong to Philadelphia Yearly Meeting. And, oh well, yes, you're a Quaker? Yeah. Or, I'm, which meeting? I think I would have, I think you spoke there one time when I was babysitting. Okay. And our Quaker community is going through a tremendous upheaval you know, because of um, Charlottesville and many other things that have made them question their white privilege and their place in the world. And we have a organization inside of PYM that's called Undoing Racism, and it's sort of like a white Black Lives Matter movement, which is 
very weird and they're very antagonistic to the whole spirit of what we're trying to do. But my advice to the Quaker meeting and to all those who are struggling with this is you don't really know white supremacy and white privilege in a real sense. Charlottesville was an indication of that. When I was incarcerated in Lewisburg, we fought the Aryan Brotherhood. And in order to get into the Aryan Brotherhood, you had to kill somebody black. So we slept with knives under our mattresses so they couldn't sneak up on us and you know, murder us as a way for them to, to get into the Aryan Brotherhood. That's racism. That's white supremacy. That's a serious mental condition. What we see evidence in institutions is the remnants of a society that has been going on for years and years. And that's something we can deal with, something we can discuss, something we can mediate. Like when a person wants to kill you because you're black, you can't mediate that. That's the And we deal with all these issues. All that was a part of mass incarceration. All that was a part of social injustice. So when I came home and I saw all these conditions, it was natural for me to say, how can I bring the weight of what I've been taught and what I've been practicing to Philadelphia? So I founded the Center for Returning Citizens. And we do a wide variety of things. We do direct services which means we find jobs, we find housing, we do referrals for a wide range of services. Are there any social worker students here? No? A few, yes. We do a lot of social work. But I call us ghetto social workers because we deal with the reality of our lives and we have reality-based workshops. I'll give you an example. I got a guy sitting in a chair in front of my desk, and he's very upset because he's come home, and while he was incarcerated, his wife left him. And now she had a baby by somebody else. So he's mad at the world. And he still loves her. And he still wants her back. Well, here's a news flash she loves somebody else. She doesn't belong to you anymore. But you want to injure her and or murder him because of your life situation. But here's the reality then. While you were gone, he was not only feeding his new kid, he was feeding your kids. So don't you all have a debt of gratitude for taking care of your family while you were gone? Now that's a very hard sell to a young brother in braids, you know, sitting in front of my desk. Is you crazy? I should be grateful to him? Yes, brother. And you should deal with the reality of your children. That's what's important right now. You being a father to your children. Your wife is gone, but they're here. And once you find a job and you move forward, you know how many fine girls there are in Philly? <laughs> Go find one. That's reality-based social work. That's telling the truth about life situations. And that's what we do every day. In addition, we do a lot of advocacy, which is what I'm doing tonight. Here, coming, speaking to you. Educating you and advocating for what we feel are real solutions. This morning, the reason I got on my full of Eagle shirt, although I'm a serious Eagle fan, is there any Dallas Cowboy fans in there? <laughs> <laughs> to the back of the room, please. <laughs> I was involved in a meeting with Malcolm Jenkins, uh, Troy Benson, um, three other Eagles, and Jeff Lurie, and Roger Goodell, the NFL Commissioner, which was amazing. And we were in a room with six other small organizations like TCRC, telling them what we needed 
to move forward and do our work in this city of Philadelphia. Because the reality of reentry is like everything else. Small grassroots organizations like TCRC do not get the major funding necessary to move us forward. So we exist on donations, we exist on small grants, we exist on volunteerism, interns. We couldn't do the work we do you know, without volunteers and interns because we can't afford to pay a large staff. So we finally got a situation where through the ACLU and a brother named Bill Cobb, who, who's also a formerly incarcerated person, who is the deputy director of the ACLU's Smart Justice Program, they were able to reach out to the NFL, reach out to the Eagles, and begin to craft a partnership so we can get funding and we can move forward, which was an incredible thing. And this kind of advocacy is what's necessary to move us forward. We go to Harrisburg on a regular basis. Why? Because we're dealing with a Republican-led House. So we have to build relationships necessary to get legislation passed and to block legislation that is detrimental to our constituency. And it's not just the returning citizens who are out trying to blend into society, it's the incarcerated nation that's still inside the prison. We have a large network of TCRC members who are in state prison, who are in federal prison, who we're in constant contact with, and we are dealing with their issues. They want a good time bill, which means that when I was incarcerated, when I got 20 years, no matter what I did, if I went to college, if I got a PhD, I was still going to do those 18 years on that 20. If you have a life sentence, you aren't doing numbers. You're doing life. We call life sentence death by incarceration. That's what it is. So we advocate for those who are inside because their concerns are our concerns. Because I have not forgotten all those who I left behind and all those who are there all across Pennsylvania and all across the nation. There's 50,000 people that are incarcerated in the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections. There's 80,000 kids who have parents who are incarcerated. Think about the impact of mass incarceration on children, on wives, on families. When you take so many people out of the community, you're taking the earning power out of the community, you're taking family direction, you have young girls and young boys growing up without their fathers and their mothers. There are so many grandmothers in our community who are raising their second generation of them. And it should not be that. And these are all things that I saw as problems, and we began to craft a response to them. How am I doing on time? 30 minutes in? Yeah. I've been talking that long? <laughs> all right, let me get this together. So, one of the major things that we saw is that economics is the key solution to mass incarceration. Why do you think I said that? Anyway. Yes? Well, because if you can't earn money, then you can't really get by without, like, like if you're earning money, then there's less motivation. Like, ah. Yeah, like, you're right. Like, if you, if you, if you get out of prison and you're, not earning any money, there's no way to not keep doing whatever you're doing to get into prison. What is recidivism? Yeah. Recidivism, what does that mean? Yes. Basically when people end up going back to prison with the last three years, leaving the criminal justice system. And she's right. Within one to three years. And I've done a lot of PowerPoints on this and there's a trajectory, you know, usually in the first year, people are really trying hard, you know. They might have done four or five, six, you know, 10, 12 years, all right, and they don't want to go back. So the first year, they're really, really trying. But <coughs> it's 
very difficult to find employment. We have folks who have come to our office who have literally filed hundreds of online applications. But that's what it is, online applications. You, know, you rarely get a job just walking into a place, but sometimes you get a job through relationships and through contacts, and that's usually the best way to find a job. So it's hard to find a job. It's hard to find housing. Many landlords will not rent to you. If you are, if your family lives in Philadelphia public housing, and you have a record, and you come home, you can't live with your family. So now you have the a situation where you're home, trying to do the right thing, trying to contribute to your family, but you have to maintain a separate residence, usually a room which is $100, $100 a week, and that takes away from what you're trying to do with your family. So there's a lot of issues. So what we saw is that we need to deal with the problems in a holistic manner. So we came up with the village. And the village is a concept that is how can we attack the core problems that exist? And we started with Nice County Over, which is a North Philadelphia community in which we live. So we looked at how can we transform Nice Town into a community that will be a bulwark against mass incarceration, um, criminal, uh, the criminal justice system, and the entire conditions that are so detrimental to our community. So in creating the village concept, we looked at what do we need in the village? First, we need a farmer's market. Because we live in a wasteland in terms of nutrition. Anybody know what poppy stores are? What are poppy stores? Somebody tell me. Little corny stores. Yes, little corny stores. Corny stores. No. Corny. Because they don't sell anything of value. They sell snacks. They don't sell nutritious food. It's, it's all takeout. It's all you know, honey buns and, and, and chips and soda. And that predominates in our neighborhood. In our neighborhood, it's mostly takeout food. There's not a single restaurant where you can walk in, order food, and sit down. Can you imagine that? There's not a restaurant in our neighborhood where you can't sit down and eat. That's terrible. So a farmer's market. Also a health, health center. There's no doctor's offices in our neighborhood. No doctors, no dentists, no x-ray, no diagnostic. We have a temple hospital down the road, and that's where folks go to the emergency room when something is dire. But for their primary care, they go other places. I go to Drexel University's clinic at, um, off 13th and Girard, which is a long way from where I live. That's my primary care provider. So we're looking at what are the existing conditions? What's the inventory that we have? And what design principles that we have? So this is the area, if you're familiar with Philadelphia a little bit, um, Temple University is in the center there, Temple Hospital is up top. So nice town is that area there in yellow, and then roughly with the center city, City Hall, Broad Street. I love City Hall. I spend a lot of time in City Hall, and I feel extremely home there because I meet as many gangsters in City Hall as I've ever met when I was in Broad Street. So this is the rough outline of the village, and let me just go over what we're looking at here. Um, up top, we have a lot of vacant buildings. We're looking at a health center up top, you see, right up top here. Um, we have Germantown Avenue. Germantown Avenue is a major commercial corridor that runs through Philadelphia. It runs from 
from Chestnut Hill all the way down into near Center City. And this part of Germantown Avenue back in the day used to be intensely populated with black businesses. Now there's only one or two or three dotted along Germantown Avenue. And that's something that we have to change. I stand in front of the Center for Attorney Citizens, which is on Germantown Avenue, right above Pike Street. And I watch kids from Assignment Grass going to school in the morning and coming home in the afternoon. And as I'm watching hundreds of kids walk down the street, going toward Broad and Area to get on the free buses and the subway that is there, my thought process is they should be going into the individual businesses, putting their bags down, and getting ready for work after school. But they can't do that because we don't own those businesses. And the merchants who own the businesses will not employ them. So when we talk about high crime rates, when we talk about lack of opportunity, a lot of it is because we don't control the economic life of our community. And our dollars do not circulate through our community. They go into the pockets of those who are outside of our community, and they go back to the suburbs at 8 o'clock at night. Germantown Avenue is a ghost town because all the merchants pull down the shutters, get in their cars, and they go back to their communities. And that's the reality of the economics. So this is an overview of the area. You see Pike Street, Germantown Avenue, Lycoming, North Broad Street. And this is the existing conditions. The yellow is the residential, and the red are the commercials. The green is the very smooth, very few green areas that we have in our community. We had um, the water department come out to look. What the water department does is they will give you grants to green your community. We need intense greening in our community. When Philadelphia University came out and they did their initial survey, they said our children suffer from nature deficit disorder. And I had never heard it. But it simply means there's not enough trees, there's not enough grass, there's not enough bushes, there's not enough flowers. And that's the reality of our neighborhood. It's all kind of. This Inventory chart is the 75 properties that we need to acquire to make the village a reality. And this is the preliminary village design that moves forward. And you see the parking box, uh, charter schools, a lot of churches. You know, as the black Philadelphians, we do a lot of praying. Yet, churches should be the center of economics, social change, but they're not. And that's something that has to be addressed. So. It's because they choose not. Yes. I said that's because they choose not to. Yes, yes, and that's, you know, um, I hate to say that the Center for Returning Citizen is, when I say most of our support comes from religious organizations, it comes from white religious organizations, like the Quakers and the Unitarians and, and Jewish synagogues and, and um, the Catholic Church. The churches in our neighborhood are in the business of taking money out of your pocket during collection. And of course, they give you a nice gospel song with it. You know, maybe a good um, chicken and fish dinner. But the reality is, they are not literally millions of dollars pour into black churches every Sunday. And the preacher drives a nice car, and it's a nice church, nice pews, but none of that money is being put back into the community. So we're talking to them about not only investing in the village, but investing in some community work that will benefit those who live with us. As we put together this plan, we looked at how we can anchor the village. 
So if you look at the very top of the screen, well, well, to my right of the screen, you have an art center. In Philadelphia, and especially in our neighborhood, our school system, the first thing they cut is art. music, um, fine arts. It's gone. So we want to create an art center that our children can learn to play musical instruments, learn to dance, have drama, have a theater, have a movie theater. When I was a kid, every neighborhood had a movie theater. And that's where you would go, 52nd Street, Uptown Theater. Now there's no movie theaters in our neighborhood. You've got to go to a mall to a multiplex. No, a movie theater, a place where there's plays, is a cultural center in there. So we want to create that. This mixed-use building would be low-income housing up top, but stores down below. Because we want to create a center for commercial activity. The vocational center, and I'll show you a brief um, video of it. The concept is many of our young people and many returning citizens are not going to college. So they need to learn trades so they can earn a good living. The farmer's market, as I said, is essential for us to have good food in our neighborhood. How many folks have been to Ready Terminal? Isn't Ready Terminal amazing? Just thinking about Ready Terminal makes you mouth work. There are so, such a vast array of choices. Do you want food? Do I want this? Oh, ah, damn. That's what we want to bring to North Philadelphia. So many food choices, and also a food co-op, and link with farmers in outlying areas to bring in fresh food. We want a hotel, because we want this area to be a destination. And we want to acquire as many houses as possible in the surrounding neighborhoods because what happens anytime you have a project of this size is gentrification. And long-time residents are forced out by rising land values and rising rents. And a lot of folks in our community don't own their homes. They rent from landlords. And as the land values go up, they'll be priced out of our community. And we want to forestall them. So here you see what is now the building for the vacational center, what is now the building that projected to be the art center. This is McFerrin Street, which is a small street adjacent to Pike. And we want to turn that into a pedestrian walkway. The vocational center will feature all sorts of trades and a link with the Philadelphia unions. This is the beginning of what will be the farmer's market. We want it to be similar to Ready Terminal, as I said. And the art center, our um, architect, Pablo Minuto, was trying to show art centers in other areas that have been successful and have brought a wonderful cultural vibration to the neighborhood. This is what we envision McFerrin Street will look like once it's revitalized. And there's no place in our neighborhood that looks like this. There's no place for our kids to go and play that's safe, that's not their porch or right in front of their house, or maybe the schoolyard, which is several blocks away. And this is Germantown Avenue. And we want to turn Germantown Avenue into South Street. How many of you go to South Street? And the South Street on a Saturday night is kind of hot. <laughs> you definitely want to do that. So this is an overall view showing all the different. And what we also want to do is create housing. There's a lot of raggedy, vacant housing that we're going to tear down and revitalize because we have to bring in people who will shop at the farmer's market, who will go to the vocational. 
off-center, who access the off-center. And of course, the greening of the area is essential. So we're looking at uh, developing Germantown Avenue as a commercial and a social court. And that's so important to bring people to a place where, where are you going? I'm going to South Street. No, where are you going? I'm going to Germantown Avenue. I'm going to the village. And, and have the urban anchors as a, a major part of this. So folks will be coming in because their kids have a dance class in the arts center. Or at 7.30, there's a serious movie in the theater, and I want to see that. Or um, a up-and-coming rapper is doing a little show at the theater. All sorts of things can be envisioned when you create destinations. So we want to develop public spaces. We're also talking about putting Wi-Fi on McFerrin Street so that, you know, as the kids come, because you know, a lot of kids in our neighborhood, they have phones, but the phones aren't on unless they have Wi-Fi. You know, so they can sit in the park, and they can Snapchat, and you know, they can do whatever they want to do because it's Wi-Fi. So we're going to turn this area into a pedestrian street, encourage um, a sense of community. You know? And a lot of folks say, well, what about crime? What about drug addicts? What about drug activity? You will find that that lessens when the environment is transformed. It has to move somewhere else. And that's the reality. There's supposed to be music here with this, you know, but um, as always, technical difficulties. But let me kind of walk you through this. So this is, this is
This was created by the students at Philip University. And this is the vocational education center. And remember on the map, you saw the tall seven-story building. This is what it will look like when it's done. What we are envisioning is a partnership with all the unions in Philadelphia. So returning citizens and any young person or any ordinary citizen in our community who wants to learn a trade, whether it be carpentry, sheet metal work, painting, plumbing, could come to this facility and take classes and once they complete their training, go right into an apprenticeship, which is a career. Right now we're working with a church right off of Broad Street that the pastor is a former sheet metal worker. And two days of work, they had classes in the evening and they train our guys to pass the sheet metal test. Our guys who have passed this test and, and began to work as sheet metal workers, they started at $20 an hour. After the first year, it's $25 an hour. After the third year, it's $35 an hour. When they finish their apprenticeship, and they begin to move to become a journeyman at $65 an hour as a top rate. That is a career. When you talk about a living wage, that's more than a living wage. That's like drug money. <laughs> Only they can't take it from us. And that's the reality. So we're looking at creating an environment, and you see the solar panels and a green environment, basketball courts, and a community center, um, automotive design, because with cars now, there's no more shade tree mechanics. You almost need an electronic degree to fix a car. So we want to create a new generation of mechanics. We want to do STEM training, you know, computer classes, and equip our young people to move into the 21st century in a strong way. That's what the village is about. Changing the concept of fully incarcerated people, creating opportunities for our young people who are caught up in situations that are not of their control. And when you don't have jobs, and you don't have opportunities, and somebody puts a package in your hand, you're going to sell it. And as you're doing that, and someone infringes on your territory, there's going to be a shootout. So crime is directly related to economics. So we envision this vocational educational center as a alternative to the street. And that's extremely important. That usually runs a little smoother and there's jazzy music in the background. But um, this is what it is. But this is what we're looking at to create as a part of the village. And we have a urban design team that is creating these representations for every part of the village, for the farmer's market, for the charter school. And we need a charter school for our kids because our kids are not served by regular charter schools or by public schools. And I speak from experience. Then I raised my kids from behind bars with help of my family. And it was extremely difficult. And it took almost a superhuman effort. When I came home, my kids literally had boxes of letters and cards that I had you know, sent them over the, over the years. And I spent my entire earnings inside on phone calls and visits and whatever they needed as they were growing up. But not everyone can do that. But not everyone has a family structure that can move that forward. So a charter school, a, a um, hotel. Hotels employ several hundred people. So we're talking about jobs. The construction of, of the village has to utilize labor from our community. As we bring in unions, as we bring in developers and contractors, they have to pledge to hire our people to work on this project. So we want to 
transform our community into something far greater than it has ever been. And this is the dream of a former bank robber and a former drug dealer, myself and Anthony Dickerson, who over a three and a half year period have worked to make this a reality. And right now we finally have hard money lenders who have pledged millions of dollars to buy the property necessary to move us forward. And they're doing it for a reason. They're doing it because they believe in the project. They're going to lose the money to buy the property with a one year installation debt. At the end of that year, they have to have the money back. So they're probably hoping that at the end of the year, we don't have the money and they'll own all this property. They don't have a clue as who we really are. So, yes, I do. I know you have questions. I have questions. Yes. How would I uh, volunteer to help out? What can we do? <laughs> um, I mean, manual labor. Um, and then if you're doing like STEM training and basic stuff like that, maybe I can teach courses. But I don't know. That'd be incredible. Um, I had a bunch of cards in my bag when I went this morning to the um, Eagles meeting, but frankly, I I got so excited meeting Jeff Lurie and all the players, I left my bag at the building. You know, so I can't give out a lot of cards. But um, Dr. Printing has my um, information, and uh, maybe you can make up a, a uh, sign-up sheet. Um, we have interns. We have internships. In fact, right now we have um, two students from LaSalle, and uh, one from Temple, and uh, one coming from um, Drexel. You know, but, we would welcome interns from Rosemont. We have a lot of volunteers. Um, we do a lot of events, especially in the summertime. Um, if you wanted to volunteer to be interns, to be part of what we're doing, we need some fundraisers. Who's good at fundraising? <laughs> Another question? Yes. Uh, how long do, um, is this project going to take to complete? We say five to seven years. Five to seven years, yeah. and what year are you in now? It's in phase. We're in the first year. You're in the you first know. year. This is the groundbreaking year. Um, we're in the process now of, of buying our first seven buildings, and the city's going to give us two buildings. We're negotiating with property owners. What we're trying to do is game what's called site control. All right. One of the reasons we haven't really publicized the village a lot in Philadelphia is we want to control the properties and move this process forward and then uh, do a lot of publicity and grow investments. Yes. Okay. Never mind. Listen. So <laughs> hello. How you doing? Um, so my name is Nia. I actually grew up uh, born and raised in Germantown okay. uh, with my family. So your your plan, which you mentioned, was to basically turn Germantown Avenue almost the same way South Street is. Yes. And so my concern would be, what have you guys talked about to combat the problems that, say, the residents of South Street have with all the younger generation people hanging on South Street? Because they have their own police department right there. But in Germantown, the closest police department, say, from like Sheltonham in Germantown is like 10 blocks in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So what did you guys talk about that in that type of aspect? In terms of um, security and, and making the area safe? Yes. Well, our closest um, police station is on Huntington Park and about 23rd Street. Yes. You know, so it's, it's yes. um, down away from the village. And um, my partner and I have discussed having a small mini police station in the village. He's against it because he's like police. Um, his idea is to have our own security force, you know, made up of folks from the neighborhood who we train and they would do security.
And then if there's any larger problems, they will call police in. And the reality is, if you create an environment that's a community base, then you may not have a lot of the problems that you have in other areas. You know, when I talk about every time I'm going to be on South Street, I'm more talking about sidewalk cafes and nice restaurants and nice shops and being a destination. And yes, the kids are going to come. But if you create one thing South Street doesn't always do is to create events for the kids to do. They're just hanging out with them. Well, we want to create a interactive environment where kids come and they do things that are beneficial. And also create jobs. How many kids work on South Street? You just hang out with them. We want to do it far different. Yes? Uh, have you done any research into uh, if this whole village idea has been done before or in any other part of the country, and whether or not it was successful? Well, there's Homeboy Industries, um, which is in California, and that's a model. That's a, it started out as a small cluster of um, t-shirt shops and it grew into the various industries that were run by fully incarcerated people. But to our knowledge, a concept like the village has never been done anywhere in the country. You know, not inspired by returning citizens, not revitalizing an entire area and um, bringing together all the elements that we have brought together. Has anyone read um, Michelle Alexander's um, New Jim Crow? I know you're reading um, um, Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy. If you get a chance, Google Michelle Alexander. Her book, The New Jim Crow, is like the Bible of mass incarceration. And she's a wonderful influence on um, social justice, mass incarceration. It's like when she speaks, people stop and listen. And she's a personal friend. And she's going to be on our board of directors because what the New Jim Crow did was to show America what mass incarceration really is. How when you come home from prison, you're actually a second class citizen. In only 15 states can we vote. All the other states you can't vote when you come home. And there's varying mechanisms that you have to go through in order to regain the right to vote. Like in New Jersey, you have to be um, off parole probation and have no fines. You know, um, Delaware the same. But in Pennsylvania, you can go right to the voting booth, right from the prison gate, once you register, which is unique. But there's a lot of rights that formerly incarcerated people do not have. So Michelle Alexander's book opened America's eyes to the reality of what mass incarceration does. In the same way that Brian Stevenson's book, Just Mercy, opened the eyes of the public to the death penalty and the injustices, the gross injustices that it caused. I'll tell you the truth. I mean, I cried through Brian Stevenson's book. I mean, there's some you know, spaces, uh, chapters, scenes in that. If you're not crying, you're not human. Because it's just, you know, how did this happen in America? So I mentioned her to say that how I pitched her to be on our board of directors and to push the village of Asha Marcel. Your book opened folks' eyes. But what's the next step? What's the solution to mass incarceration? What's the solution to social injustice? Projects like the village are the solution. Because you're creating jobs, you're creating community, you are creating a revitalization process. <coughs> and that's something you don't see every day. And it's extremely important. Yes? So um, you borrowed a lot of money to start developing the area. 
So how, what's your plan for actually paying that back within the first year? We have developers who have a pledge to bring in funds to pay the money back to the hard money lenders because they want to be a part of the development. And this is a $120 million project. It's going to cost $10 million to buy all the property. So the developers will come in and have a meeting tomorrow with the um, main, uh, main staff that is putting together, which is our architects, our um, um, green specialists, the financial advisors, and Next week, we have a meeting with three developers. We're going to be in the process of, of deciding who's going to build what and how much investment dollars they're going to bring to that project. Yes? Have you had town halls with the community around where the village is going to be with regards to your concerns or ways that they can be involved in health and different things of that nature? That's the same thing that um, the city of Bass asked us. Two weeks ago, we had a meeting in our city council office because you know, she said you, know, you haven't done enough, you know, um, community meetings. And our answer to that was we've had talks with some key community players. We haven't had community meetings yet, you know, with the larger community, and we're not going to until we have site control of the key properties. And once we have that, then we'll have a multitude of of community meetings. But we've had key meetings with Nice Town CDC, which is the CDC to the north of us, um, Call to Serve CDC, which is to the south of us, and they're on board. We've had meetings with um, pastors in the area. I mean, even though, as you can tell from my commentary, you know, I'm not a big fan of a lot of pastors, they do have influence. And one thing about black pastors is they know money when they see it. And they would like to see their churches in that area be surrounded by a better community. It'll bring more parishioners, it'll bring just a better community. So that's my answer to that. Is that sufficient? I have a lot of issues, but it's okay. No, no. Speak on it. Because, you know, the black community has been bamboozled so much by a lot of that same community. And, you know, with, like you said, economics is an important part of us coming up and raising ourselves up. But if we don't have the knowledge, you know, or have the information, like, to help make informed, informed decisions on things that are happening in our communities, I mean, what makes that diff your project different than any other project, and I just don't mean to be disrespectful with them no, no. that's going around. Only reason why I'm saying this is because if you involve the black community, we actually really like to be involved in stuff, and we are involved in a lot. But when we're not told and things are just happening, just to, you know, just, you know, like you said, you haven't really, you're not really saying anything until you get control of the buildings. Well, you know, it's something that, you know, a lot of people are going to feel, a lot of community members are going to feel like, well, you know, these are things, why can't they do this in the white neighborhood? You know, why can't the same thing be done in a prestigious white neighborhood, you know, where they have those things as well? You're gonna bring all these inmates in, which a lot of people are scared, and saying, you know, they have, some of them have a mentality where it's not gonna work or, it's, or they're gonna be afraid that, you know, this is gonna turn into something where you're gonna see more underhanded crime, more white collar crime. And then the black community still suffers. Does it feel like still money? Yeah, point blank. Yeah, because okay. it's, been, it's, it's something that's happened, All you right. know, especially in the city of Philadelphia. Let me speak to that. Um, your concerns are real, and I acknowledge them, and I welcome them. And we've had this discussion with um, politicians, with, um, with community members who are aware of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And my answer is this. If you walk through our neighborhood, it's like you're walking through a war zone. There's like vacant buildings, you know, shuttered abandoned houses, and no one's doing a damn thing to 
during our neighborhood park. All, right? um, all we have in our neighborhood is stop and go, liquor stores, Chinese food. You know, there's so many Chinese restaurants in the neighborhood. Might as well be Tokyo. And that's ridiculous. Because there's no soul food restaurants in, in Chinatown. You know, that's why there's so many Chinese restaurants in our neighborhood. We don't own anything in our community. At Broad Erie, there's a Black Cleaners, there's Dwight's Barbecue Restaurant, there's Black and Nobel's Bookstore, and that bookstore is dying because folks don't read books anymore. Nice. There's very few Black businesses and Black investment. So what we're talking about is revitalizing an area and Understand, in the farmer's market, it's not going to be all black businesses. Who wants a farmer's market with 100 soul food restaurants? It doesn't make sense. There's going to be a wide variety of restaurants and food choices, just like it is at Reading Terminal. The only difference is we will own the building. We will own the revenue. We will own the hotel. We will own the vocational center and the medical center. So the revenue that we generate in the village, we can put back in the community, and we can go to other parts of the city and make more villages. Our vision doesn't just stop with North <coughs> Philadelphia. We want to make this a model of what can be done across the country, and yes, by former inmates, by returning citizens, by the same ones who used to shoot up the neighborhoods, sell drugs to the neighborhood, who have transformed themselves and are ready to atone for what they did in the past and to create a new reality. And yes, I will tell you, this is going to gentrify this neighborhood. But it's going to be gentrification on our terms, not on white corporations' terms. And that's the difference in what we are doing. Yes. Good evening, sir. My name is Mr. Baker. I'm a senior here at Roosevelt College. I have two questions. My first question is, what does the acronym TCRC stand for? And my second question is, is the village focusing more on rehabilitation and regentrification of Germantown, or is it more of a focus on kind of like reintroducing those who are previously incarcerated back into kind of like the community in general, civilization in real life, or is it like a combination of both? So um, I'm just not explaining that. Um, was used to saying TCRC building, but TCRC stands for the Center for Returning Citizens, and we pioneered that term when we came home, calling ourselves returning citizens. And we're not formerly incarcerated. We're not ex-cons. We're not ex-felons. We're not ex-anything. When you say ex. You're talking about the past. We're talking about the present and the future. We have returned to society. We've always been citizens. We simply lost the rights and responsibilities of citizens, citizenship, due to our being incarcerated. Well, now we're home. And like Patty Bell used to say, we have a new attitude. And we are going to make moves in our community to move forward. What was the second part of your question? Uh, the second part of the question was, is the village specifically designed for kind of gentrification of Germantown, or is it like a combination of like reintroducing those who were, forgive me for saying, like formerly uh, those who were in well, the of system? Exactly. Well, it's, it's going to create um, two scenarios. You know, the village is about revitalizing our neighborhood, making money, and creating an economy that we control. That is the foundation of that idea. Now, during the course of that, yes, we're going to create opportunities for formerly incarcerated people, for black-owned businesses, for millennials, for young people. You know, in our art studio, we're going to have music studios, you got a thousand rappers in North Philly. And half of them can't rap. 
But they need a place they can come and do studio time so they can find out they can't rap and the way it goes up. So we're going to create a wide range of opportunities for a lot of different things. And in the structure of that, yes, returning citizens are going to have some priority. But if I get five returning citizens who want to open up the same thing in a farmer's market, and I get two folks who have a better, different idea, I'm going to diversify. Because we're not going to have, you know, 20, 30 shops selling the same thing. You've got to come with a novel, um, interesting restaurant idea, enterprise, and it's going to be spread <coughs> over the whole village. Not just the farmer's market. We want shops up and down Germantown Avenue. We want trees. We want those uh, wonderful um, giant pots of flowers in the summertime, sidewalk cafes, you know, and Frankly, the homeless, you know, we're going to create spaces for them where they can get showers, they can get clothes, you know, and, and you know, they can get the help they need, um, mental health, drug addiction, you know. We're going to look at how can we create a holistic community. And it hasn't been done in the city of Philadelphia. Well, the village is going to be the first model. And I would love for, you know, those of you who can see the vision and you'll be graduating in a couple of years, come work with us. You know, bring your talents, bring your expertise, you know, bring your intelligence. Yes? I'm not really, I'm not familiar with the neighborhoods, but uh, I'm, I'm Dan Toon, I'm at uh, Philosophy End up here. Um, that neighborhood, those houses are there because the factories that used to be on North Broad making all those, those textile the clothing business in Philadelphia, the other North Broad was a great industrial strip at one time. Don't, aren't those houses there because they need to house the workers that work in those factories? Yes. What he's talking about is what I now call ghost factories. If you drive through North Philadelphia, how many folks drive through North Philadelphia? Or familiar with North Philadelphia? You know, you can drive down the avenue, you know, you can drive um, anywhere north of Broad Street, down Huntington Park, and you see huge factories that are now vacant. And these are the factories that Tasty Cake and, and all kind of different factories, uh, Budweiser used to be in. There was a, there was a Baldwin locomotive factory on the yes. earlier. Um, they made railroad trains. Yes. right in the middle of the city. But my, my question to you is, um, how would you respond to the possible criticism that this is a utopia? That, that when, when Germantown Avenue had a thriving business corridor, um, when there are movie theaters and stores, and the basics that people lack in their neighborhood now, then it was all, that was all financed by the, the jobs, the, the, yes. the, the, the mass employment really, that, that those factories provided for working people. How are you going to, how is this, the village going to be sustainable, absent that sort of broad working class uh, employment base? And that Philadelphia has frankly lost since those factories closed down. You have to bring back jobs. Um, we work with Google Industries, and the CEO of, of Google Industries is a Republican. And his, he has a thing that he calls tax-free filling. And he wants to bring back manufacturing to the city of Philadelphia in the same way New York did by offering corporations tax-free status and property if they come in and take over some of these host factories and move that forward. And how do you create a political climate that will allow that? So we created the Block Party, which is the first political action committee for formerly incarcerated people and millennials and folks in our neighborhood and across the city. It stands for Build, Lobby, Organize, Campaign. Here's another reality. There's over 300,000 formerly incarcerated people who live in the city of Philadelphia. But we don't all vote in the same direction. 
We don't all think in the same direction. Many of us are caught up in the same petty robberies that we dealt with when we were incarcerated. But the Black Party is created to move a voting block of formerly incarcerated people and their friends and their families to control the political life of Philadelphia. We're looking at how we can effectively change how business is done in the city of Philadelphia. And let me give you an example. I just have a question. You're next. Let me give you an example of what we've already done. On May 16th, we elected Larry Krasner as the DA candidate for Philadelphia, a civil rights lawyer who's opposed to the death penalty, no cash bail. He's solidly on the side of the people. And that's going to be a seismic change in the criminal justice system in Philadelphia. And we are done. We're looking at the governor's race, the mayor's race in, in 2020, city council races. By 2020, we should be well on our way to controlling Philadelphia's political life. And you can call that utopia. I mean, it's a utopian vision, but it's not utopia if we're able to move forward. Yes. It's going to be the last question, man. I've been enjoying myself, too. I've been doing this all night. I understand you want to build a market and an arts center. But is that really enough incentive to sustain the hotel, to attract people to come and stay in a hotel in, in nice town? Well, um, what is going to be nightclub on top of the hotel? It's going to be pop. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, how a hotel is really um, sustained is, is through marketing. I mean, we want to make the village a destination. And we want to build not only low-income housing, but senior housing and condominiums. You know, because we have to attract more of a, a tax base to sustain what we're trying to build. So hopefully, you know, folks will move in, you know, seniors when their their families come to visit, they'll stay in a hotel. Uh, we do a lot of different events. Um, through our connections with, you know, um, celebrities, um, athletes, um, Eagles players, Sixers players, we want to make the village an attraction. You know, so that folks come, stay in a hotel, um, shop in the village, and make it a tourist destination for those outside of Philadelphia. And trust me. If we're successful in doing this, folks from all over the country are going to want to come and see what is this new model. And when they come, where will they stay? In our hotel. Why don't you come manage it? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much to Shandai for taking some time out to speak last time. Thanks very much to you all for coming out. And I should like to say that the, uh, there's a video recording that will be posted up on uh, the Rosemont College YouTube site, um, hopefully soon. So if you know anyone who missed, um, if you'd like to revisit the lecture, please visit the, the YouTube site and you know, get that information again. Again, thanks very much. And also, go on our website. It's um, tcrcphilly.org. There's more videos and a lot of information there. And also, join the block party. Go on the block party site. Blockparty.org.